will win the game. Uh, I hope you are doing well during this time of confinement again. Uh, we try again to defy and challenge this confinement, defying fear and repression. I'm consciously and cautiously using the term fear and repression as long as I am dealing today with psychology, trying to introduce today the psychological approach in the area of critical theory. And the key term today is psychology. Psychological approach is an important and interesting approach, but also controversial. Interesting because it has brought new life to the reading of literature. Controversial because it questions the pertinent use of such approach when analyzing literature and uh, I try to ask and produce, and produce this approach through some key questions. The first one is what relation is there between psychology and literature? How far does literature inform psychology? What contribution does the psychological approach bring to the analysis of literature, what are its limitations? I try to answer some of these questions and I'd like first of all to introduce the approach. Uh, relationship between literature and writings has long been, and uh, psychology, has been the concern of critics, writers, and the moment I say uh, psychology, I, 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 for example, introduced the word catharsis. I am sure you know what I'm talking about. Definition of tragedy, combining emotions of pity and terror, just the use of terror and pity, and the impact of tragedy on the audience, the emotional response, how it relieves the emotional tensions. Horace Gulf Sandhu Time, the purpose of literature is to be enjoyable, pleasure, and to instruct as well. Uh, Sir, 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 Sir Philip Sidney, when he talks about the effect of uh, poetry and the moral effect of poetry, he is also psychologizing, psychologizing literature. The romantics dealing with imagination, and have in mind Coleridge, Wordsworth, Shelley and the power of imagination in freeing the soul and Wordsworth's expression, the spontaneous overflow of our feelings we are familiar with here shows that the impact of the poetry on the reader and the outcome of literature on feelings and emotions. In uh, modern times, Holy James takes art as a source of life making life makes interest important and there is no substitute apart from literature which produces a sense of beauty and uh, enjoying life virtually every literary critic has been concerned at some time with the psychology of writing or responding to literature which means that from ancient times uh, the relationship between literature and psychology has been uh, an important concern but, but with the modern time, when I use psychology, I have in mind the figure uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, the father of psychology, and his contribution to psychology and uh, opening a new gate in reading literature. And his contribution lies in his discovery of the unconscious, the desires and the defenses, key elements and Freud, as we know, began his psychological work in the 80s, 1880s, he tended to treat, to treat behavior disorder. And his first patients with hysteria disorders, he started to treat them by listening to his patients, which means language, talk. And through this language, you are going to retell 
their stories, their history from childhood until the moment we are talking. And of course, he's going uh, to lay bare the dark points of the unconscious and detect uh, the behavior and the unconscious which has uh, which has an impact on this behavior. So human beings, according to Freud, are motivated, even driven by desires, fears, needs, conflicts which they are unaware of, of which they are unaware. And uh, according to Freud, uh, the unconscious uh, was influenced by childhood events. And he organized these events in four development stages involving relationship with parents and tribes of desire and pleasure, uh, where uh, children focus on uh, the parts of the body, the mouth, the oral, the anal, the phallic, these are all phases here, and these stages reflect basic levels of desire, but involve also fear, fear of loss, love of genitals, fear of castration, affection from parents, loss of life, so uh, uh, degrees of repression. Uh, so when these desires are repressed and they are hidden, the expansion from consciousness of these unhappy psychological events here uh, lead to repression. And repression does not eliminate our painful experiences and emotions. We unconsciously behave in ways that we're allowed to play out. We play our conflict, uh, conflict feelings about the painful experience and emotions that we repress. And we keep these conflicts buried in our unconsciousness. And uh, Freud says that we argue, uh, he argues that we develop defenses, we select perceptions, memories, we deny this memory, we displace, we project, we regress, we express our fears, fear of death, fear of intimacy, among others. So there are defenses. Uh, the contribution of Freud here is that he has managed to unveil these conflicts and inner contradictions. That is to say, he has questions the degree of reason in controlling the human behavior. So, uh, on one hand, we are uh, confused, clear headed, frustrated, satisfied, hopeful, despairing, selfish, altruistic, in short, a complex human being. For many people, this picture of the individual has an essential validity. Uh, his uh, conception of art is uh, really uh, unclear because, uh, and it's not stable. On one hand, he, he considers artists as strange beings. Sometimes he associates writers with madness, sometimes with neurosis, uh, and uh, his contribution to uh, literature uh, is shown in his paper, Creative Writers and the Dreaming. Uh, we, we can find a, a sense of uh, psychoanalytic literary procedure uh, where he uh, puts the artistic creativity in the relation to dreams, uh, in part to dreams, and he tries to interpret the, the dream, the literature, in terms of the dreams. So he uh, considers concepts of the unconscious, and uh, you are familiar with his reading of the Oedipus complex, the tear of the instincts, and the interpretation of dreams. He, he analyzed many famous little texts, literally Oedipus and Hamlet, and uh, Freud admits that the creative writer is a strange man, as I said, who himself cannot cognitively explain his power to arouse new and intense emotions in us. Uh, uh, he's mostly widely known for Oedipus complex, and he said that we do things really weird and silly things sometimes for reasons that are to some degree hidden, inaccessible, beyond our direct control to our awareness. That is to say, we are unable to control our motivations, our behavior, because there are layers of the past, of the unconscious, which are there controlling our behavior. Uh, psychological criticism here, uh, also known as psychoanalytic uh, criticism, is the analysis first of the author's in unintended message, and also the application of such an approach, of the principles of psychoanalysis, to the study of literature. And the main goal is 
to analyze the unconscious elements within the meta text based on the background of the author. Uh, also, the method of psychological therapy in which free association, dream interpretation, analysis of resistance transference are used to explore repressed or unconscious impulses, anxieties, and internal conflicts in order to free the psychic energy for as much your love and work. Uh, Freud's three premises on which such a theory is based are the following the unconscious, sexuality, and repression. The unconscious, that is to say, underneath the surface of the iceberg, is the subconscious. So, like iceberg, the human mind is structured at great weight and density lie beneath the surface, below the level of consciousness. And it shows here that the load of the unconscious is very important here, according to Freud, because that's where the behavior of the man of the human being is uh, uh, controlled. The second point, which is important in Freud's uh, theory of sexuality, all human behavior, according to him, is motivated ultimately what we would call sexuality or libido. And that's another thing that it is to be questioned in Freud's theory here. Sometimes it is exaggerated. The third point is repression. The powerful social taboos attached to certain sexual impulses here. Yeah? Many of our desires and memories are repressed, that is, actively excluded from uh, conscious awareness, but they turn into uh, subconscious. The impact of Freud here is that his foundations, his contribution to modern psychology, is his emphasis on the unconscious aspect of the human psyche. Uh, he has changed our notions of human behavior by exploring new or controversial areas such as wish fulfillment, sexuality, the unconscious, and repression. That is to say, he examined the symbols to study how the unconscious mind expresses itself in coded form to avoid censorship of the conscious mind. Also, uh, Freud uh, divides the person into three parts. And it is working to balance the libido in an efficient manner. It divides into three main parts the id, the ego, and superego. The id is the first portion of the personality developed the wants, the needs, the desires, and aims. This id is aims at achieving pleasure and avoiding pain. The rational does not care how it wants or obtains. So, this is. The pleasure principle. The ego, opposite the it, focused on morality and justice. The judgment portion of the personality uses intellect to gain order within the situation, works against the it, and tries to control its impulses. Ego tries to control the impulses, the it, a reality principle. So pleasure uh, and the it, uh, and the reality principle. The superego, the third element here, is the bridge by which tempers the id and the ego. It provides a balance, so both sides are at an equilibrium. It makes decisions if things are right or wrong, has the ability to reward the feelings of acceptance or punish by feelings of guilt and shame. That is the morality principle. Brief example, it, I want chocolate. Ego, I want just a piece of chocolate. The superego, you are on diet. So you can see that the periwinkle tries to control the desire of the it. Uh, Jacques Lacan uh, reformulates in linguistic terms for its account of the Oedipus complex and says that the unconscious is structured like a language. And according to Lacan, human unconscious is not full of dark impulses, but rather it is full of the scores of others. And he poses again three orders, the state of human mental disposition, the imaginary state, the symbolic state, and the real state. And he said the imaginary state here, it is a stage of the wholeness, of totality, the pre oedipal stage, where the self and the other are one. There is no distinction and idealized identity with the mother, so it's one. It's still uh, with identification with the mother. While the mirror stage, it is the stage of split, 
It corresponds with the first stage of primary narcissism, that is to say, subject in love with its own image, its own body, which precedes the love of others. So at the same time, identifies with and alienates itself from the mirror image, thus the sense of unified self is acquired at the price of self being other, the mirror image. Uh, and Lacan here is going to uh, subvert Descartes' cogito when he says that cogito and custom. I, I think, therefore I am. And what Lacan says is that I think that you think there is me, therefore I am. So the self is there because the other, the reflection of the self is there. Okay. Uh, the symbolic uh, stage here, on which Christie later from the concept of the semiotic, uh, post-language acquires a stage. The child enters the language system, concerned with lack and separation, since language names what is not present and substitutes a linguistic sign for it, the real stage. And when uh, the child being enters the symbolic stage, is that he starts to uh, abide by the law of the institutions of the father, and that's later when uh, the uh, feminists are uh, de destructing the concept of the symbolic age, like Christie, I say that we have. That's where we have to think about introducing the semiotic and avoiding the symbolic order, which is that belongs to the father. Uh, and Lacan sums up the uh, uh, project of Freud, and he says that since Freud, the center of man is not where we thought it was. One has to go on from there. So it is very important revolutionary contribution here because it questions the traditional notion of the consciousness. First postulate is that we be a form of otherness within ourselves. We cannot claim fully to comprehend even, even ourselves. Why we act as we do, why we make certain mode of and political decision, why we have a religious disposition and intellectual orientations. Even when we think we are acting from a given motive, we may be deluding ourselves. Much of our thought here are determined by our unconscious, uh, far from being based on reason, on thinking here, the, uh, uh, our thinking is intimately dependent upon the body, instinct of survival and aggression. Again, the unconscious governs our behavior. It is the ultimate source and expansion of human thought and behavior. And you can see here, I'm much more focusing on the unconscious because it's the key element, apart from the liberty and the repression, the unconscious here has problematized all of our notions here. And it has, as I said, revolutionized all the concepts that are, uh, have been handed throughout centuries. Uh, methods of dealing with conflicts, when these instincts are repressed here, the repression, this is one of the methods to deal with conflict. We hide our desires and fear in the unconscious, selectively forgetting about whatever is troubling. We eliminate the trouble, the pain, isolation, disconnecting one's emotion from a traumatic event, understanding something should be upsetting but failing to react to it. Sublimation, also, it's a method here, and here, this is, we can see, we, where artists try to redirect an acceptable desire into creative act. It can be writing, it can be painting, it can be any other form of activity, it will, we redirect a certain unacceptable desire. Displacement, replacing an acceptable object of one's emotion. That is to say, shifting one's emotion from a, threat, a threatening target to a less threatening one. Deny, to deny, to refuse to accept one's unacceptable desire of fears, or refusing to accept the traumatic event. Projection, to project our unacceptable or worthy desire or our fears on others. Intellectualization, avoiding one's desire and fears by analyzing and rationalizing them instead of feeling them. A reaction formation, believing the opposite is true to avoid facing the truth about a traumatic event. So you can see we have a list here of methods to avoid a conflict, to uh, divert this conflict. So psychological criticism here. Uh, deals with instances again of repression, isolation, sublimation, displacement, denial, projection, 
intellectualization and the reaction formation in the actions, for example, of characters in the piece of uh, art. Internal conflicts uh, present in characters that cause them difficulty fitting into society or being unhappy. Expressions of the unconscious in characters, dreams, voices, creative acts or interactions, slips of the tongue, jokes, etc. Description of the unconscious in texts, patterns or repeated behavior in texts, how a character's identity is developed. So, some of the techniques can be borrowed from psychology, from uh, the, the Freudian paradigm, in order to be to apply it to uh, a text. Also, uh, uh, we can uh, locate some symbols and images. They are brought from interpretation of dreams by Freud here, and these are, according to Freud, their own sexual interpretation of symbols and images. And so he classified them in three elements again. Uh, concave item, he thinks that all elements which have a concave item, palms, cups, vases, caves, viewed as female symbols, elongated item, towers, mountains, peaks, snakes, knives, and so on, they viewed as phallic symbols. Certain activities like dancing, riding, flying, viewed as symbols of sexual pleasure. To what extent are these elements correct, sound, Believe that's the question here because they are always related to the libido according to Freud. Uh, uh, I, I can see uh, move to some examples to see the applicability of these according to Freud himself here is that he interprets Da Vinci's interest in painting Madonnas. Uh, it was a sublimated expression according to him of a longing of his mother from whom he had been separated at an early age. So this painting reflects loss of the mother, and thus he wants to make uh, the mother live for long, uh, for an eternity in the moment of painting. Uh, I, I, I can go over some examples, probably you are familiar with some of these. Probably you can pick up Iago in Shakespeare's Otelo, motivated by this narcissistic behavior towards Otelo, not because Otelo has overlooked him, so he has turned his love for the Simona into hatred because of the self, uh, which is negated by Otero. Uh, uh, probably Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, a woman writer, producing a text where there is a, 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 the creation of a monster. Probably the monster is a phallic, a quest for a phallic image, but the monster is going to look for, uh, looking for the female. Uh, so, uh, you have uh, the sexual interpretation of Frankenstein is also uh, applicable. Uh, the same thing for the creation of characters like Heathcliff in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff, example of the, uh, the desire, Heathcliff is the wild, the violent, and also the text is taken place in the Moors, Wuthering Heights, written by all. Probably it is an expression of the repressed desire of a woman living in a patriarchal conservative society and the desire for uh, the, the, uh, the other. Uh, John Keats, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, probably this uh, uh, fear of engulfment, the creation of a dream, the dream quality here, uh, and a woman is a destructive figure, fear of the woman, that's the question, and it can be read also from a psychoanalytic point. Uh, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse and Jim Joyce, for example, here, two modernist writers, and I can see that modernism here has drawn from Freudian psychology, especially for Virginia Woolf, because we know that uh, the Freud's uh, publications were first done in the Hogarth Press, which was directed by Virginia Woolf and her husband. And when we take, for example, The Lighthouse, you can see in the novel uh, the image, uh, first of all, Virginia Woolf herself says that she cannot write until she symbolically kills the father figure, the father figure, and she starts to write a repressed image of the father. And we need to the right house, you can see the family, Mr. Ramsey and Mrs. Ramsey. And between them, we have the uh, James, uh, probably can bear it from uh, 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 the Oedipus complex, uh, because the novel starts with the first sentence, yes, yes, which is said by Mrs. Ramsey, a movement to the right house, there is a journey. And uh, we have uh, later, the father says no. So between yes and no, uh, the, the James felt 
a certain anger, and he wished that he had a knife that he can put in the father's uh, chest. You can see that it can be a love towards the mother, hate towards the mother, but at the end there is a movement to the lighthouse, a phallic image. And this phallic image here, it means that the husband has subdued to the wish of the, the son, and the Lily Brosco has a brush, which is again another uh, fragment. It's a long story. Uh, we change also part of the artist's resume. The story again starts with the child. The father is telling a story, but the father has a high, hairy face, while the mother has a nicer smell, and so on and so on. So you can see that there are a lot of examples, and the Freudian uh, psychological interpretation can work, uh, uh, and it, it can be a logical in this interpretation. The advantages of this uh, approach here is that, yes, it is a useful tool, tool for understanding some works in which characters obviously have psychological issues. Like the biographical approach, it's no, uh, it knows something we know about the writer's psychological makeup, uh, and it can give us insight into his work. It can also clarify the hidden, invisible, and frustrated motivation of author and characters. It can offer different readings to a piece of art, and the psychological sense seems to enhance the artistic value. However, some psychological, the psychologism here can uh, turn work into a more than a psychological case study, neglecting to view it as a piece of art. Critics also sometimes may attempt to diagnose long dead authors based on their works, so uh, perhaps not the best evidence of their psychology. Uh, critics also tend to see sex in everything. It is exaggerating this aspect of the show, and I believe it is not the only drive. Misusing psychology is to try to apply it to everybody's reaction. This oversimplifies the complexity of the human life. Human beings often do things for more than one motivation. So psychology is not an answer for all uh, the questions. Also, the aesthetic value of the text can disappear if we continue to interpret the text from a psychological point of view. Finally, some works do not lend themselves to this approach. The overanalysis also can be a big mistake because the psychological approach is the tendency to see sexuality in everything, as I said. Images, symbols, and actors are not necessarily vigilant. Many not make sense, may not make sense for literal analysis. Uh, uh, the belief that sexuality is present from infancy onto life, that's also to be questioned. I finish by quoting some of the passages here from Freud. This one is very important, as I said here. The great motive question, which I have not been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? And the question like this makes me ask question, question Freud himself here. Is it not the unconscious in her speaking? Apart from that, I will try to focus on this point when I deal later with the feminist approach. Uh, some of the quotes he related to the artist, he said that the creative writer does the same as the child at play. He creates a world of fantasy which he takes very seriously. A work of fantasy and believe in this fantasy. Poets are masters of us, ordinary men, in knowledge of the mind because they think as streams which we have not yet made accessible to science, which shows that poets here are dealing with things which are not uh, accessible, probably to, related to, to unconscious, to the unseen, to the invisible. Uh, and the more perfect a person is on the outside, the more demons they have on the inside. The are goes to reflect on, and uh, as I said here, is that uh, Freud is inconsistent in his dealing with the art and artists, because sometimes he, he they are uh, masters of the, of, uh, of the man. Sometimes they are related to neurosis, sometimes they are madness. The last quote here is that taken from civilization and discontents, very important. We are threatened with suffering from three directions from our body, which is doomed to decay, from the external world, which may rage against us with overwhelming and merciless force of destruction, and finally, from our relations with other men. This last source is perhaps more painful to use than any other. So we can see here the three elements here, body, external world, human relations here. These are elements based on uh, the suffering and how man handles this suffering through repressions, 
to return to the unconscious. Briefly, the uh, post the uh, psychoanalytic approach, as I said at the end, is a very interesting uh, approach because it gives us uh, an insight into the analysis of art and literature. But as I said, it is controversial because it may misguide us, it may lead us to fall into some over interpretation and that's a mistake. Thank you very much. See you for next time for Arab approach.